it's Polly here. So we have Sherry. We have Sherry. Why? Because um, <laughs> the uh, the sun is over the yardarm, and I'm going to speak to you about a sterling game, a damned, damned fine game, a gentleman's war. Brilliant, bloody brilliant piece of work. So a gentleman's wars inspiration has come from things like H.G. Wells' Little Wars. It's also got its roots in some sterling old games um, like um, the, the um, Sword in the Flame, which was a great set of old um, miniatures, rules for the colonial period. But these are kind of inspired by toy soldier battle games. Now, you can play this as a serious war game, and that's what I like. I think these are great War, serious war games rules but the inspiration is kind of the toy soldier thing so this means you can play this with any scale you want but it'll work really well for 54 mil troops like the old airfix plastics and many of the plastics and metal ranges that are out there still today or you can just play it with your 15s and your 28s and all that stuff it's all there as they've been giving examples of setting up armies i do love what they, you know they they're narrator's voice has done good things okay so we've set up this unit here so uh we've got um one officer um waving a sword but for firing purposes he counts as one more guy armed as the rest of the unit uh same goes for one drummer um one man holding the queen's flag bless him bless him bless him steadies the boys you know steadies the boys and nine figures who are all identically cast holding their <laughs> <laughs> in the same identical positions as as the Lord God and William Britton surely intended. So so a wonderful tongue-in-cheek tone through all of this. So these rules are designed for essentially individually based soldiers that are then collected into you know, regiments. Um, uh, foot regiments can be like 12 to 15. Um, there is no set hard rule. Um, they just say if it gets bigger than that, they become unwieldy. Um, cavalry units are around about half a dozen guys. Um, if you are firing, you can fire up to two ranks deep. Um, if you are fighting, you can fight up to two ranks deep. Unless you are infantry in a column, I think when you can fight up to four ranks deep. Um, you can count guys on the flanks as well. So if a column hits a line, you know, the guys on the flanks fight, etc. Um, canny modern players can, of course, put these things in movement trays, so you're not having to move individual. Um, troops along. If you've got skirmishers, they space themselves out a bit broader than um, your um, normal line-to-line -line troops. You've got a space of kind of one guy between each of your guys. Simple, simple, simple. It's got a kind of a 19th century geist to its basic set. So it's saying these are for that kind of H.G. Wells Little Wars kind of end of the 19th century, 1900s sort of period, like the H.G. Wells Little Wars rules. I really like the way these rules are laid out. Um, to clarify rules and give examples, they've done a sample game. And as if it's an old bewhiskered you know, ex kernly sort, who's got a young nephew, Waller, you know, and he's trying to show him how to do the game. And old bewhiskered ex military sort is a little bit cheaty, a little bit trying to push the envelope, and a little bit trying to sometimes take uh, advantage of the fact that Nephew hasn't played the game before. Nephew is catching on and giving the old bugger a run for his money, so it's actually kind of a nice, um, a fun little narrative on the side there. But it's a very good way of, of illustrating all the rules. The rules are, are, in fact, very simple, and this is why I love them. I think this is a terrific game, because it gives you a great game. It's not bogged down in hyper-realism, it's bogged... The only thing it bogs down in is character. You know, it, it, it just gives you a great set of rules to play a game with and have a great time with your friends. So as I said, individually based figures. Um, you have a card based system. At the start of the game, you shuffle a deck and you decide which side is going to be playing red cards, which side is going to be playing black. You deal out cards and... Red cards go to the red card player. Black cards go to the black um, card player. Jokers, which remain in the deck, get put back in the deck. I think you deal out six cards. So at the end of this process, each player will have zero to six cards. Now, these are your hold'em cards. They are used essentially for kind of bonuses and interruptions during the normal game. When a game turn begins, from that well-shuffled deck, you turn over a card and... 
that gives you who can move and what. The red side moves on red cards, the black side moves on black cards. Number cards, you can move a single unit. If it's a court card, you can move a group that you have put together as a brigade. A brigade is up to four units that have their individual units no more than sort of three inches apart from each other. They're very easy going on um, exact distances because we are all gentlefolk here. We're not here to argue over tiny little minuate of, you know, millimetres and, and sixteenths of an inch. These guys were intended to be a brigade and they're clearly supposed to be or whatever. It doesn't matter if they've drifted a bit. You know, we'll just chop them together as need. We are all gentlefolk and we're all here to have fun. This stays all the way through. Bless them. So you can move a brigade. Generals can bridge units for a brigade. So it's three inches from another unit or from a general. So like three inches, general, another three inches, you know. So you can use these guys as the pins. But anyway, you can move. And now, when that card is turned over, it activates units. You may fire and then move. Although artillery can do any combination of fire, move, move, fire um, that they wish. They can do artillery charges and so on for some of the horse units where they can kind of go forward at charge speed and unlimber and fire. But... In doing so, they treat the firing as if it's at a much longer range. But you can get your kind of thrilling race the guns forward into the action. Everything's full of the stuff that your cool toy soldiers would do. It also emphasizes all the way through it. Toy soldiers are very brave. You know, so we don't have to worry about all these minuati of hundreds of little um, morale tests. We only test when, you know, serious things are going seriously wrong. Toy soldiers are very brave. So, yeah, so that's your activation. Now, I kind of like this because what you can do, for instance... If you activate a unit, you can fire and then charge with them. So you can like do some damage to someone and immediately charge in and try and, you know, do some more damage to someone if you wish. Um, if you are charging somebody, you announce the charge. All movement in this is random. You're rolling dice and you roll that number of inches. So if you're charging, you roll extra dice. Um, obviously, you're on horseback, you roll a, you roll a ton more dice. Um, and uh, if you can't reach the target you can either elect to kind of recall the charge in which case you are now disordered and but back at the starting line or you can kind of push it and try and contact the guy but now you're disordered um, or you get to halt where you are and kind of receive whatever his response was to the charge now um cavalry can counter charge cavalry infantry can counter charge infantry um but essentially what happens is the um Defender gets a number of actions that it can use in response, and this will vary according to a, uh, a dice roll. Um, and he gets a number of actions firing at the charge um, at the range at which the charge starts. That's um, like an action. Firing kind of um, point blank before he hits. That's another action. Counter charging, attempting to turn to face flanks to face flank charges. Um, breaking and evading if you are skirmishers and or artillery crew who are allowed to do that those are all actions so um, okay you choose which actions you want now you've got those hold'em cards those hold'em cards can be used to interrupt someone else's action so if someone's going to do a move and ah you want to preempt his action haha um, I'm playing an interruption card and you play it um, the guy that's being interrupted can use one of his interruption cards to interrupt the interruption but if you do that you basically both turn the cards over and whichever one has the higher value um, is the one whose interruption counts. So you know, holding onto those high value cards could be useful if you've got a, a crucial attack that you're wanting to push through. Okay, um, those hold'em cards can also be played in charges and melee. They can be used to um, redo rolls. They can be used to gain extra actions uh, and all that sort of thing. So they are a, a useful resource to keep. And of course, the higher the card, the better. Now, as you're turning the cards, do, 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 as your units are activated, you put a counter behind them to let them let everyone know that that's one that's had an action. It can't fire and move. Also, if you've charged someone and they've um, then done a, a flight move or something like that, then they count as having... Um, activated this turn so they don't get a turn um, those counters they show some nice ones you can just use anything but they show they are using they've either got um, old British pennies um, old Victorian pennies or, or Edwardian pennies that they're using or they've got like fake um, penny blacks that they've kind of stuck onto a, a square and so on so I um, some good good ideas they're just for little props um, 
you when a side has had all of its units activated its cycle is over the turn may not have finished but once it's had all of its units activated its cycle is over and what you do then is you remove all of those counters and any units that were disordered which can happen to you through firing and morale checks and so on those effects are removed and now you keep going the turn only ends uh, when the jokers come out in play um, when the first joker comes out it lets you know um there's a um, um <laughs> that's your warning when the second joker comes out ding the the turn is over reset all markers are done the fact that someone might not have finished all of their turns etc well hmm, um uh, tough that's that's um fog of war reshuffle the deck and off you go now um there are some um little things that you can do with aces and so on uh if you when you're turning the cards for your turn if an ace comes up you can use that to activate a unit that has already had a marker on it and activated with this turn you know somehow the boys have got the fire up on them or they've got the opportunity so you know there is again some fog of war some things can get the extra move it's a simple movement system it's got a lot of flavor a lot of character and a lot of gamesmanship in it i really like it honestly i think it's a really good system firing Depends on the weapon that you've got. Um, the default weapon is, um, you know, breech loadery sort of things. They've got rules in there for um, muskets and for magazine rifles. But the idea is, again, we're not too worried about it. We're just getting a good game. So a general breech loading rifle, um, it's split into different range bands. The only difference with muskets is that they tend to have a much shorter range. And uh, magazine rifles have um, a um, higher chance to hit at close range. But basically you're rolling D6s to hit. The range band tells you what score you need on the D6 to hit. So obviously, you know, closer is easier. And you just roll. Um, and that gets the number of hits. You're effectively rolling, you know, I think it's one dice per couple of men. It'll, it'll, it'll tell you. Um, sometimes you'll be firing something that have got, like a uh, artillery piece. Um, the number of crew in the serving the piece will give you the number of dice that you roll up to a maximum so it's up to a maximum of four but your gun crews may start with like about six guys in them so they can take some casualties before they start whittling down the number of dice that they roll maxim guns and um gatling guns and all this sort of stuff are you know statted in there as well um you've, you've got the full kit and caboodle um but yes once you've done your hits um the target gets saving rolls the saving rolls are um it, again it's a nice old mechanism it's an old school mechanism but it has both sides involved so you don't feel that you're left out uh and obviously if you are uh, in um in woods behind bushes um partial concealment cover or uh, defending walls and trenches and so on obviously your saving throw is is way better in fact if you're defending like trenches and so on i think um your saving throw is really good it's really hard to get rid of those bastards you're gonna have to meet them with cold steel you know just plinking away these boys will do nothing you know um <laughs> so in you go cavalry cavalry is actually um nicely done there's of course um heavy and light cavalry and and as the rules say these are the ones that just turn what could otherwise be a somewhat shabby brawl into a matter of honor um so yeah um they are quite effective in combat but charging undisordered infantry is going to get you killed and rightly so or at least doing it frontally um so you got to wait for them to be disordered and you know suffering a bit of damage before you send the boys in because those disordered guys don't get um defensive actions that are going to stop you um but cavalry can also be there's different types and styles there's mounted infantry there's dragoons and all this sort of stuff so there are dragoons who are guys who are perfectly happy to dismount and fight on foot most cavalry when they fight on foot are rotten shots um there's mounted infantry who can um ride and dismount always as skirmishers and they are not rotten shots etc so you've got these kind of guys who can do some interesting things now when you are designing your troops uh and buying your army you can also buy distinctions um so these are little things that give little bonuses or little penalties under the rules so you can have a points value system for buying an army if you wish and um so you can decide units are gallant 
Um, so, you know, they, they get a, a slight bonus in melee attacks. They are stalwart. They get a bonus in um, melee defense. They could be crack shots. They could be marksmen. Um, they could um, be uh, resolute. So they get um, morale bonuses. Um, they could be fanatics. They could be... Um, terribly brave they could be swift faster than other people so you know you can you can make these wonderfully tooled units um there are bicycle troops and all these sorts of things in there which as i say that people who are riding some kind of mechanical conveyance for those of you who are rolling this over into steampunk they can be your steam velocipedes or you know what have you so uh yes there is you can roll this over into steampunky stuff if you wish um there is a appendix on the end which is colonial matters which brings in um other troop types such as tribal infantry and tribal cavalry the the tribal cavalry are not as effective in malay as sort of formed troops but they sh they can shoot very often and um they can evade and do all these sorts of things and um tribal kind of infantry be it um you know mad mullers dervishes or um zulu warriors and so on um Obviously, uh, some of them have guns, um, so, you know, your Patans and um, um, some of your uh, some of your dervishes and so on. Uh, so they can kind of break up into the ones with guns and can break up into skirmish groups and can skirmish. But um, the kind of sword and shield or sword and um, uh, Azagai, or in fact, Ikhala, um, infantry, yes, uh, that charge into close combat. Obviously, they can't shoot and so on, um, but if their morale stays and they manage to close, it's a bit like being hit by cavalry. Um, so they're, um, they are quite dangerous. If they beat you in combat, it's dangerous. And that's, that's one of the things I like. Um, Malay is quite exciting in this because if you beat someone uh, and you've got movement left over, you can keep going. Uh, and in fact, there's a little chart that you roll on for infantry versus infantry, cavalry versus infantry, and so on. And you roll depending on how well you won the melee. And what you do in melee is you basically you're rolling a number of dice depending on the number of troops you got fighting, rolling for hits. Whoever got the most hits wins. Um, the difference between the two scores is the casualties that the, that are taken by the loser, etc. But also, if you've beaten him. That's one value. If you've doubled the number of casualties that the other guy has caused to you, then um, that counts as doubling, which means that there are more dire consequences for losing the combat. And someone can also be um, basically um, doubled and their unit, if it's doubled and reduced. So if, if in at any time a unit is reduced by one third of its starting figures, it has to do a morale check. So your worst thing is to take so many casualties in melee that you have to do a morale check and you've been doubled so that there are extra consequences. Extra consequences for cavalry um, beating you might mean that um, you do a flight move, but the cavalry guys get another move. And if they contact you, the melee goes on, but now they count as attacking you from behind. Likewise, if you flee through other units, they can now contact other units that are behind you. So, yahoo, another melee. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of exciting. For once, you get breakthroughs and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, you know, again, it gives an exciting game. Very easily adjudicated. And um, there's a lovely list of different nationalities at the back with their suggestions for what might be national characteristics. So here, here are the Bosch. Um, uh, here's the the Russians. The Russian guys are kind of stalwart, but they're a bit slow. They're not good marksmen, but um, you know they're um, the morale's quite high on the fence. Here are the British. Um, if you're doing kind of post Boer War things, they they're quite good marksmen. Uh, before that, they tend to be very stalwart and um, they're, they're cavalry are well mounted, that sort of thing. Here's um, oh these American wallers, you know, as like they're, they're cavalry's um, cavalry's dragoons, you know, they they're um, very willing to let the side down a bit, and you know jump down on the ground and fight with, uh, you know, revolvers and carbines and so on. But, but we don't think too badly of them for that, you know. So, um, great colour. This thing really um, is great for imaginations gaming. Imaginations gaming is where you invent um, your own countries and invent your own kind of time period and you play them. And those are great. So, yes, you can play the mighty um, um, Kingdom of Rorschach. <laughs> hail, hail, Grozny, oh, Grozny to the skies, Grozny. To the skies you can do all that um which is great we have done those before they're hilarious and so you can make your own army with your own themes paint your own figures your own way and these are hilarious now they've put in rules for doing these things with muskets and so on because they said to americans there was um 
these play sets, which were very common back in early days, you'd order them in comic books, which were flats, and they were American Revolutionary Wars flats, and you can still buy these today. So that's another kind of common way for like the American um, geist. That's what kind of toy soldiers meant to them. So you know, obviously you might want to do this for you know tricorny and musky sort of period. So yeah, here's the musket rangers and etc but you can roll these over into anything from kind of you know world war one to muskets you can do it for you know um you could do it for blenheim you could do it all uh, and again you can do imaginations for it all you can just play this as an average everyday kind of war game which is great they've also got some things on kind of keeping it in the toy soldier kind of feel if you want to do that so here's painting schemes for how to paint units so they got that toy soldier look you know <laughs> a gloss varnish and a gloss varnish pink cheeks and um they've got um guides for doing if you want the toy soldier look well here's what basing and painting looks like for that yes things tend to be painted a uh, a a bright grass green shade and so on and um yes the terrain's very neat and very blocky or possibly twigs raided from the garden you know if we're trying to keep the toy soldier look so they've kept the gag of that going and that's great but as i said it can be played as a really splendid kind of serious war game they've got a lovely list in the back of miniatures manufacturers that still make toy soldier rangers and they're covering uh, and they cover those from like 20s 15s and 20s 25s 28s 40s and you know the 130 second scale 54 mil so there are a lot of plastics manufacturers and some that do this they've got them all in there plus if you do a google search you find a ton of um toy soldier manufacturers so again if you wanted to play this and didn't want a huge outlay like i'm i, I am sure dear viewers that very few of us could afford to go out and buy an army of a couple of hundred britons figures at about seven or eight pounds each um yeah you might have to take a second job to be able to afford that but you know plastics or so on and there are tons of really cool 25 28 mil plastics ranges now um so you can just go out and play this so look you know why why do i love these rules um they are a selection of some of the very best old school mechanisms that have withstood the test of time like a card based maneuver system you'll find that in things like sword in the flame and those dice rolls and saving throws those are very old um, mechanisms and they are inclusive for both players they work but it's got some great gamesmanship twists like playing the aces to put extra moves on units that have already activated the brigade rules and so on um, the variability of having the joker end the turn um, these are great um the things to watch for in the game as you're playing is watch for disruption because that lowers your chance of defending in a melee so if you go into terrain that's not suitable for your formation or if you take enough damage to cause you to do a morale check they're not that frequent toy soldiers are very brave <laughs> but now you become vulnerable um, and don't fling the cavalry straight in frontal attacks against infantry it will get shot to pieces unless you know, so you want to you want to bombard them with the artillery or you know bust them up with some fire or come in on the flanks and those sort of things so perfectly sensible things but this gives a game that's got pace it's got playability it gets you engaged um the rules are great you know you're in there and you're playing and you're rolling dice and you got your, your groups moving forward we're not too worried about realism but we are getting a really damn fine game out of it i think this is splendid work there's a page for a gentleman's war on facebook with lots of people putting up um, photos of their battles photos of their, their miniatures um scenarios and so on the game itself comes with a whole bunch of very cool scenarios and so on in the back as well but so it's it's a game that's got a community i really think it's splendid work you know like i think if i could get a bunch of friends uh, with a slightly silly inclination say hey, let's do some imagination gaming and let's do it for this for an imaginary 1870s kind of thing let's do it um yeah great rules take a look at them they're inexpensive they're up on um war games bolt great stuff so go out and check them out really and and i think they're worth playing i really do i think this gives a, a really good game as i said sterling stuff and done with enough tongue-in-cheek 
in the rules to keep you engaged. They were actually a great set of rules to actually read. You know, they, they kept you going. But anyway, if you like the reviews, by all means, subscribe and uh, find me on Patreon and all that sort of stuff. Hit the like button and, um, you know, broadcast my name under the, um, uh, under the faithful. I'll see you next time round. Cheers, everybody.